introduction. So I said in my introduction that the atomic nuclei are made of quarks and our next speaker, he knows these quarks in and out. And it was actually his theories that explained to the world how it comes that we never see quarks alone, but always glued together. We are very honored to have the Nobel laureate of in physics 2004 with us here today now with uh, a lot of Nobel coins. <laughs> Please welcome Professor Frank Wilczek from MIT. So uh, first I want to thank a few people who uh, made this event possible. Uh, it was my wife, Betsy, who uh, catalyzed the whole idea that there should be a party associated with this bet in Uppsala. So, Betsy. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, Auntie Nimi, who uh, took Betsy's suggestion seriously and brought it to uh, the attention of people at Uppsala. <laughs> uh, Tord Ekoloff, who with tremendous energy made it happen and organized. And uh, Fabiola, who did something or other, I don't uh, <laughs> And Janet for being my foil, thank you. Okay, so. <laughs> That. Well, maybe I'll <laughs> hold on to this. <laughs> ah. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to discuss uh, the theoretical context and impact of the Higgs particle discovery. It's a triumph for theoretical physics and experimental physics, first of all a clue as to the structure of the world, and a window into uh, new wonders that will uh, hopefully uh, dis await discovery in the future. So first, let me say why it's such a triumph for physics. First of all, it's an act of imagination to think that our world is very different from what it appears, that what we perceive as empty space is not empty, but full of this uh, Higgs field, which af drastically affects the properties of matter. And it's also, I think, a very important moral triumph. The standard model, as we've heard, works extremely well. And, uh, People might have been satisfied to say, well, it works very well. Maybe we should leave it alone. <laughs> We've done pretty well. But that's not the, the attitude of scientists. Scientists work very, very hard to try to get the most out of their ideas and to also see that they might be wrong. And the community of Europe and the United States, uh, many dedicated people, spent years and years, as you heard from Fabiola, uh, in this quest to see whether the ideas that we had been using happily in the standard model really correspond to reality or not. It also cost a lot of money, so thank you taxpayers all over you. <laughs> and it's also a tremendous technical triumph. It was a very difficult thing, as Fabiola mentioned. It's uh, only one in a billion or one or even less uh, of the events that actually contain something that's not predicted by the standard model without the Higgs particle. So you have to understand the Higgs, the standard model very, very well. Also, the standard model had better be damn good to allow you to, to uh, understand things so well that you can see tiny deviations in rare events. If you're looking for needles in a haystack, you have to understand hay very, very well. 
So I'll briefly offer some perspective on what's been achieved so far and then discuss uh, important questions that arise. But first, I want to make a reality check. Mass has more than one origin. And so, although the Higgs particle is often to, said to be the origin of mass, and relatedly, to be the God particle, that's a very misleading statement. It makes some people mad. <laughs> and in fact, there's quite a different source of energy whose roots, intellectual roots, go back to Lorentz and Einstein that uh, is the source of most of the mass of you and me and uh, ordinary matter that has nothing whatsoever to do with the Higgs particle. <clears throat> 120 years ago, uh, Lorentz, the, a great Dutch physicist, uh, proposed his electromagnetic theory of the origin of the electron, which at that time hadn't been discovered as a particle, but he had the theoretical idea that there should be such a particle. According to uh, Lorentz's idea, the thing that causes the electron to have a mass, that is to resist changes in its motion, which is what mass is, in a sense, uh, inertia, is that Electrons ca uh, have electric fields around them, and when they move, also magnetic fields. And those fields, if the particle moves, those fields have to adjust. Those fields might not want to adjust so smoothly. They may resist changes. And Lorentz's idea is that changes in those fields, the resistance to changes in those fields, is what uh, makes electrons resist changes in motion and have mass. That theory uh, didn't work out, but in a modern form, in quantum chromodynamics, our theory of quarks and gluons, it actually basically does. It's not electric and magnetic fields, but they're colored gluon analogs uh, that come into play, and it's precisely the back reaction of those fields resisting the motion of quarks inside protons that's responsible for most of the mass of ordinary matter. More than 95% quantitatively. So if you're overweight and on a diet and have a hard, having a hard time uh, getting your mass down, uh, that's why. <laughs> Very impressive and detailed calculations stand behind those words. I'll just show you. Uh, these are results of gigantic computer simulations of uh, solving the equations of quarks and gluons to see what kind of organizations of energy they can make. Small organizations of energy in a small volume are what we call particles, so we call those organizations particles. There are many different kinds, uh, and they have masses that have been measured very accurately experimentally, and then you can also calculate theoretically what the masses should be and you see the agreement is spectacular. So there's no doubt that this is a correct theory. Uh, Nobel Prizes have been awarded for it, so it better be correct. And among these particles, N stands for nucleon. That means proton or neutron. So we have, the, among the rest, the explanation of the neutron and proton mass, which is almost all the mass of ordinary matter. So the origin of mass here is what I kind of call Einstein's second law. Most of you are probably very familiar with Einstein's first law, which is E equals mc squared. This is a different one. <laughs> m equals E divided by c squared. It shows you that if you have energy, even of particles like up and down quarks and gluons, which have no mass themselves, if you have them in a small region, moving around with concentrated energy, uh, that energy represents the mass, namely the mass of protons and neutrons. Okay. 
Now, back to the Higgs particle, the other origin of mass. Uh, mass from medium, or more poetically, cosmic molasses for particle masses. The equations for particles with zero mass are especially beautiful. They have extra symmetry for experts, gauge symmetry, chiral symmetry, scale symmetry. All kinds of wonders happen for zero mass particles. And an outstanding example of that is that photons, the quanta of electricity and magnetism, have zero mass. So, to have the most beautiful description of nature, and also to have the most unified theory in which photons are uh, related to other particles in a deep way, uh, we'd like to make the world from zero mass building blocks. Unfortunately, several kinds of elementary particles refu refuse to cooperate. They stubbornly don't have zero mass. And they don't move at the speed of light, which zero mass particles are supposed to do. So, uh, who can interpret this symbol? I found this on the web. Excuse me? That's right. Here, give this man a coin. So, it seems you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have particles being photon-like and yet having non-zero mass. But actually you can. This was the discovery of the Higgs mechanism. And basically, the idea is that space, even where it's apparently empty, is actually filled with a sort of cosmic molasses that slows some things down. So in empty space, they would move as if they had zero mass and at the speed of light, but in space as we actually find it, not. A tremendous act of imagination. My favorite metaphor for this is a little different because molasses is you know, kind of icky, sticky. <laughs> that is, that suppose there were an intelligent race of fish that started to do physics and uh, think about the laws of motion. Well, at first they would derive very complicated laws of motion because the way things move in water is very complicated. But eventually some fish genius, Fish Newton, would <laughs> realize that he could have a better, or she, could have a better description of the world by assuming or positing simpler laws of motion, which we know as Newton's laws of motion, but adding the hypothesis that uh, we, got, we guys, we fish, live in water, we live in a medium that distorts the simplicity, that hides it. And that's exactly what we've discovered. We've discovered we're like those fish. We live in a sort of cosmic, universal ocean that distorts the motion of particles whose equations are basically those of massless particles, but uh, are slowed down by moving through this cosmic molasses. No known field could provide the cosmic molasses, so physicists postulated a new one, the Higgs field. Well, you're free to postulate anything you want, but if, you, if it's going to be a scientific endeavor, you'd like to ha it to have consequences. And it turns out that this hypothesis has observable consequences. Because of the following. Any field in quantum mechanics uh, can be broken down into small, minimal units. If you break little pieces of it off, you find the smallest minimal units, the so-called quanta. So photons are the quanta of light, gravitons are the quanta of gravity, gluons are the quanta of nuclear force fields, and 
Higgs particles are the quanta of this Higgs field, which is supposed to be slowing some kinds of particles down uh, and uh, giving the effect we call mass for those particles. This is also known as the cosmic glasses or the universal ocean, and the Higgs particles are the quanta of those cosmic molasses or universal ocean. Since many properties of the Higgs particles could be predicted in advance of their observation, because we, we saw the effect of the field, we could infer what the effect of very small bits of it would be, or the properties of very small bits, uh, we, could, we were able to recognize, we would be able to recognize them when we saw them. And as Fabiola discussed, uh, now we have. So now I'd like to discuss the significance of the particular value of the mass that, that's been observed, roughly 125 GeV. So that was moving from the triumph to the clue. Now we're discussing the clue. Within the framework of the standard model itself, neither the origin nor the value of the mass of the Higgs particle itself is explained. This is another shortcoming of the popular conception that the Higgs particle is the origin of mass. It doesn't explain its own mass. That just has to be stuck in. <clears throat> so the mass of the Higgs particle, or in nota a scientific notation m sub h, appears simply as a free parameter that you have to determine empirically from experiment. So it could have been anything within the framework of the standard model. Nevertheless, some of us were not surprised by the value being 125 GeV. At least one of us even bet on it. At heavy odds, no less, when the mass could have been anything from 115 GeV up to 800 GeV or more, some people had the daring, or at least one person had the daring, <laughs> to bet at 10 to 1 odds that the mass was in the tiny sliver between 115 GeV and 150 GeV. This raises the question, how did he get so clever? <laughs> <laughs> And he got so clever, I happen to know, by following the golden rule of right-thinking speculation, which I'll now share with you, which is tasteful beyond the standard model speculation should respect a wonderful result that we have that uh, the different forces of nature can come together and have a common strength at short distances but only if you make certain hypotheses. Uh, the hypotheses are called supersymmetry, or Susie for short. This is why I love Susie. I mean, I love my wife, but oh, you kid, Susie. Uh, <laughs> if you incorporate the effects of supersymmetry on the known forces and extrapolate to short distances how they will look, you find that at sufficiently short distances, the different forces, which look quite different in power at uh, the energies or distances we've observed, uh, will in fact come together accurately and unify. So we could have, we could aspire to a unified theory of all the forces. And as a special bonus, gravity, which seemed hopelessly ununified with the other forces, also joins into this party. Uh, gravity starts out much, much weaker than the other forces. See, the, the strong forces, th this is inverse coupling, so the strongest coupling is at the bottom, uh, a factor of 10 takes you from the strong force to the electric force. If you want to get up to gravity, you have to uh, multiply by 10, by 10, by 10, by 10, and so forth. Well, I have limited time. So <laughs> 40 times, 
So you, kept, you get way outside the known universe, and it was very difficult to plot, also kind of wasted because you can't see it, but I persisted, and at the end of the day, you find gravity, because it behaves differently from the other forces, gets stronger much more rapidly at short distances, it also unifies. So the bottom line is that low energy supersymmetry enables quantitative success in the unification of forces. Other shenanigans tend to ruin it. Now, shenanigans is an Irish-American expression, which probably many of you don't know. Uh, how many of you don't know what shenanigans means? Okay, so I will, uh, I will explain for you what it, what, what it means. Other shenanigans tend to ruin it. What shenanigans means is other people's speculations. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the right thinking, the rule of right thinking. Now we'll turn to the rewards of right thinking. Within any minimal or near minimal models of low energy supersymmetry, this mass of the Higgs particle is no longer, and wasn't prior to discovery, uh, a free parameter. It's predicted, in fact, to be relatively small in that band between 115 and 150 GeV, comfortably. So that circumstance, plus a glass or two of wine, plus some trash talk from Janet, lured me into my foolhardy bet, which, however, you've seen, uh, paid off. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> now I'd like to discuss very briefly the Higgs particle as a window into the future. So far, the observations are consistent with the Higgs particle reflecting a world as simple as possible. That is, it fits into what's called the minimal standard model. You introduce this one new field, one new particle. Uh, you didn't know its mass, but now you do and then everything is hunky-dory and fixed. And you can calculate the different decay rates uniquely, the production rate uniquely uh, within that framework. So that framework gives very specific predictions. Because it's specific, it might be wrong. And that simplicity may not last. I'll give one example that's very close to my heart of something that might upset the simplicity. The largest coupling of Higgs particles to ordinary matter arises indirectly in an interesting way. See, the gluons and the uh, up and down quarks, which are the main constituents of protons and neutrons and ordinary matter and also electrons, couple very, very feebly to the Higgs particle. That's why they're so light, say, compared to the top quark, which gets a lot of mass from this cosmic molasses. But it also means that if you're going to try to produce Higgs particles, starting with up quarks, down quarks, and gluons with ordinary matter, uh, you face a challenge. So the way uh, the Higgs particle actually manages to communicate with ordinary matter, the dominant way, is indirectly you have uh, color gluons within the proton here, which can communicate with heavy matter, heavy quarks, such as the top quark, uh, in, in empty space, you have virtual particles. You have fluctuations that with top quarks and anti-top quarks that live for a very short time. But if the gluons are lucky, they can find them and hook onto them. And then the Higgs particle is ha very happy to, count to couple to the heavy top quarks. So this is an indirect way that the Higgs particle couples to ordinary matter, and it turns out quantitatively to be the dominant way. Uh, when this was originally discovered, it was called the Wilczek vertex for a brief, glorious period. But since then, it's somehow devolved into uh, gluon fusion. <laughs> I, really, I really prefer the original name, I have to say. <laughs> anyway. It's a remarkable process, as I 
sort of described. It's essentially quantum mechanical. It doesn't occur without these quantum fluctuations of virtual top anti-quark pairs. And also, it's sensitive to all kinds of heavy stuff, known or unknown. We happen to know about top quarks now, but that's a relatively recent discovery. If we hadn't known about them, we might have discovered them by seeing that the gluons coupled to Higgs particles much bigger than we thought they did. And we'd have thereby discovered that there had to be additional virtual particles. Uh, the Higgs particle, because it's sensitive to mass, uh, uh, is very unusual in being, uh, cup its coupling is determined uh, by contributions of particles with uh, very heavy, in, in principle, arbitrarily heavy masses. So, if the top quark isn't the end of the story, we might find little deviations from the calculated rate of uh, Higgs particle production through gluons because of the contribution of still undiscovered particles. And in the kind of process that uh, Fabiola described as the way the Higgs particle was, dis was discovered, we sort of have the same thing twice over. In the production, two gluons go through virtual top quarks to a Higgs particle. Then the Higgs particle goes through other virtual particles, at least the top anti-tops and the W plus, W minus, also to decay into uh, two photons. And if there are additional quarks that are heavy, they'll contribute to this. If there are additional uh, charged particles in general, that are heavy, they'll contribute to this, and we'll see deviations from the minimal model. So the overall rate of production, or the two-photon decay rate, might reveal the existence of otherwise unknown, yet to be discovered, heavy particles. For these reasons, and others, it's important and very promising to measure as many properties of the H, now that we have it, uh, as accurately as possible. This is the credo, the guiding principle, I think, of particle physics, the thing that makes us special, unique, unlike, say, economists, which is <laughs> today's sensation is tomorrow's calibration. We build on what we know. Don't declare triumph, or we're not satisfied, we declare triumph, but then we move on and uh, use it to learn more. <clears throat> there are concrete, exciting prospects here. Uh, this is an estimate from uh, a paper by Michael Peskin of how accurately one can, uh, one can uh, measure deviations from the minimal prediction after a long time of running at LHC. Uh, many speculations about what lies beyond the standard model, including supersymmetry, introduce deviations from the minimal model, minimal couplings at uh, the few percent level. So as we get below 5%, uh, we'll start to have a good chance of uh, detecting some deviations from the minimal uh, structure. That'll be difficult at LHC itself, although I wouldn't underestimate the ingenuity of people like Fabiola and her colleagues to, to do better than this. Uh, or we might get lucky and find bigger deviations than uh, expected, than uh, expected by me, I should say. Uh, but in any case, now we have motivation and plans to think about the next era of accelerators where uh, it's estimated we can do much better and get well within the few percent accuracy in measuring the Higgs particle properties that really have a very good chance of showing up additional new physics. So, let me summarize. The discovery of the Higgs boson is a triumph for physics and a major step forward, but it's not the God particle. Uh, our story of the origins of mass is much richer than that and far from complete. The mass of the Higgs particle being equal to 125 GeV 
is encouraging for supersymmetry but discouraging for rival speculations. Susie has many attractions. The sirens sing. Here's a picture of it. <laughs> and uh, now we've heard some songs. <laughs> Forces unify. The mass of the Higgs particle is about 125 GeV. <laughs> and there I am, chained to the mast. <laughs> is that what it is? Is that what they're singing about? Well, we'll see. Some may be tempted to doubt. This was anticipated by Caravaggio, who uh, painted here uh, St. Thomas inspecting the wounds of Christ. Uh, what's the relevance of this? Well, doubting Thomas, I think, is the patron saint of experimental physics. <laughs> Wants to see that it's real. <laughs> But on the other hand, we also have the patron saint of theoretical physics. <laughs> and uh, we know what he said on the occasion. He said, blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. And those are the kind of people who win bets. <laughs> so, and finally... Detailed picture, study of the H properties is feasible, very important. It's going to be a big part of the future of high energy physics. Extremely exciting window into unknown worlds and uh, could yield additional gold. <laughs> 14 carat, not just chocolate. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. We have enough. Oh, questions. Oh. Can we get. Thank you. Questions. Yes, we have some time for questions. Maybe uh, Fabiola and Janet, you would like yeah. to come up too? Oh. And we can yeah. see we have a microphone, so if you wave, if there are. Any questions in the audience? We have time for two, I think. <laughs> All right. I, would I could I could start with a question. Yeah. I I have understood that uh, that the microphones. I've understood that the LH LHC will uh, close down now for maintenance for two years. Was, is, that, is this like an expected cliffhanger? So I was saying, if they don't ask questions, we will ask questions to them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. So the LHC will, um, is operating now until the end of 2012, and then it will shut down for a couple of years in 2013 and 14, in order to um, consolidate the machine, make some repair, and make it able to uh, run at 14 TV, which is almost a factor of two larger than now. And this, of course, will be extremely useful not only to uh, pursue these precise studies of the Higgs properties that uh, mm -hmm. Frank was mentioning before, but also to explore with more power uh, energy beyond the standard model, so producing heavier particles. And if supersymmetry is there, it will also sh is expected to show up not only as deviation in the X properties, but also as real particles of a new spectrum of a new theory. But, but from the runs you have already, how much can you tell about the... I mean, now you will analyze data. Do you need to do more runs before you close down, or...? <laughs> so, we, we are taking... With the data that we have recorded so far, and we recorded until the end of the year, of course, we are studying the X properties. We have already some measurement of the couplings. For instance, we have been measuring these loops that I learned today, the Vilcek loop, for instance, <laughs> to see if there is any deviation to it. For the, for the time being, we found 
nothing, no discrepancy, but with big, big errors. But we have also been, been looking for physics beyond the standard model, supersymmetric particles. Okay. We didn't find anything. Doesn't mean that supersymmetry does not exist or other scenarios. It just means that we will need to uh, look more, uh, do more studies, look in all corners of the parameter space, and perhaps also have more energy. Okay, we are really looking forward to following that. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have one question in the very back. I need your microphone. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> well, thank you for the gold coin. Um, <laughs> oh, you earned it, right? Yeah. Uh, as a non-physicist, I still have difficulties understanding the difference between the graviton. Wait, wait, no? You have, you have to speak, speak up. up. Okay. Uh, I still have... Uh, it's difficult to me to understand the difference between the graviton and the Higgs boson. So could you maybe try to explain it again? And uh, could you also tell me if how related are... Uh, the Higgs field and the gravity field. Thank you. So the Higgs field and the gravity fields are yes. related. Out. Uh, this is still on. Yeah. Um, well, they appear in a very different way in the theory, the Higgs field and the gravity field. At the level of particles, uh, the two most notable differences are probably that the Higgs particle has no intrinsic spin whereas the graviton has spin too. Uh, but there are many other differences. Maybe the most profound difference of all is that the graviton couples extremely, extremely weakly to the other part to particles, whereas the Higgs particle couples just weakly. <laughs> but it's a big difference. I mean, it's, I was thinking today, as maybe some of you may know the Angstrom Laboratory, and I was thinking it's like the difference between the, uh, the volume of the Angstrom laboratory and, and one cubic Angstrom. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, but in, but so, so they both, of course, can affect the motions of particles, but they affect them in different ways. The Higgs particle, uh, uh, well, it's present as a field everywhere, many, many Higgs particles permeating space and giving mass to the heavier particles. Uh, gravity is a universal force. It's very weak, but acts on all the particles. So they're quite different, and they're symmetry. And you know, the deeper you study, the more different you find they are. <laughs> but maybe in some future unified theory, we'll be able to put them together in a coherent framework. Do we have more questions? You have to wave your hands if we have, there we have one. Uh, what's the, uh, in Higgs boson, what boson uh, tells us? Like, it's a field or it's a particle. Uh, what boson stands for? It's both. Uh, so, just like the photon, is a represent, representation of the electromagnetic field. It's the smallest unit, the quantum. The Higgs particle is the quantum, the smallest unit of the Higgs field. Uh, the, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, may, may, oh, I wanted to elaborate a little bit. So the, 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 the idea, though, more concretely about having a Higgs field that fills all space, that's analogous to having, say, a magnetic field close to Earth or an electric field or a uh, gravitational field as we have close to Earth, where you have, in, in those two cases, many, many photons to make a magnetic field or many, many gravitons to make a gravitational field. But the difference is for the Higgs field, we want it not to be tied to the Earth but to fill up all of space, so it's an ocean that's universal and has the same properties everywhere. It can be thought of as being made out of many, many Higgs particles. And you may ask, well, if it's made out of many, many Higgs particles, why doesn't it weigh an enormous amount? Why doesn't it have an enormous density? And that's actually a profound problem. But to answer it superficially, <laughs> the, uh, 
properties of the Higgs particles as they occur in space are affected by the presence of other Higgs particles. They have a repulsive interaction as well as uh, their bare mass, and the two effects cancel. So the Higgs particles can uh, uh, live in peaceful coexistence with each other uh, at a high density. I think, I think this is the last question we have time <laughs> for, but the symposium has been uh, filmed, so I think it will be available on the university webpage. Um, by that, we would like to thank you so much for uh, your very nice lectures and for coming all over, <laughs> coming uh, from overseas to, to uh, settle this bet finally. So a big applaud for today's speakers.